Welcome, everyone. I am delighted to have you here with me, and I am so excited to have our special guest, Dr. Johanna Strong, joining us to talk about one of those really important, but I believe highly misunderstood and underappreciated marriages in royal history, Mary the First and her consort, Philip of Spain. So welcome, Johanna. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a, a nice message or email when you go, can you come and talk to me? <laughs> yes, well, and I'm always so excited when you say, yes, I'm happy to. So now, as, always. We, <laughs> as we start, I, um, I hope everybody noticed that there's a slight difference to the way I introduced you. So I would like you to tell us about becoming Dr. Johanna Strong and a little bit about the shift in your position and, and your title and all of that. So please share with us this exciting news. Yeah, it's incredibly exciting. And I got the official letter just before Christmas, um, which meant that I was back with my family and got the email. We were sitting in the car. And I said, do you know what has just happened? Um, so for the first time in 20 some years. I'm no longer a student, which is terrifying, um, but also very exciting. So I have officially finished the PhD. I defended the thesis in November and then got kind of the, the fantastic news right before Christmas that my corrections had been approved and that it was all done officially doctor um, and that kind of like when you pass your final driving test and you kind of will never be tested on this again. Um, so it, now I have the chance to be working on the thesis to turn it hopefully into a book. But kind of now on, it's when I want to do Mary because I want to do Mary, uh, right? which is very, very exciting, which has been, I work part-time now as a teacher of history and politics and my students are going, Miss, Miss, no, doctor, doctor. <laughs> and it's just so funny watching them kind of process this at the same time while they're where they go, oh, Dr. Strong. I go, who are they? Oh, me. They need me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's quite a an exciting change, but quite a big change. Um, which seems like it should be smaller because it's only two letters different. But no. Those are some two big letters. Those are two big letters. Those are two big letters. So congratulations from all of us at Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. It's just so exciting. And I know you, so I'll probably still call you Johanna sometimes, but in my heart, it is now Dr. Strong. <laughs> and I am so excited about that. And so, I mean, you were already such an expert, but we, of course, when, when I first thought, well, I'd like to, you know, February is a different kind of month for a lot of people, but here in the United States, um, there's Valentine's Day, and I thought, well, that might be kind of nice to look at some relationships, some of those royal relationships. There are also some rebel relationships, but we're today going to talk about some royal relationships, and I thought there's one that just doesn't get the attention, and I know exactly who I want to have come talk about it, so thank you for joining us to talk about Mary. Um, so in addition to it being Valentine's Month, uh, we're getting ready for a coronation that will be a king and queen concert. They are already king and queen concert, but the coronation, so Camilla will be crowned alongside her husband. And that is very typical these days for a queen concert. But the idea of a male consort is less usual because we've had fewer queen regnants. And I do think it's interesting as we sort of look at the sweep of those seven Queens, depending on whether or not you count Jane Grey, you know, okay, just wasn't long enough to really consider a coronation. So that didn't happen. But if you look at the others, William and Mary were joint monarchs. So that wasn't a consort situation with Queen Anne. She was married to George, but he, and he was a prince, but he didn't really seem that interested in playing that consort role. So that really wasn't much of an issue. So we have Victoria and Albert. 
And then we have two other queens with husbands, both named Philip, which I do think is kind of funny with so few to look at that a big percentage are named Philip. Um, but I, I, I want to start before we even get to Philip with how Mary came to the throne because it was so based on how much the people loved her, her popularity and how decisive and intelligent, strategic she was. She knew just what to do. So can you tell us just a little bit to set the stage for who Mary was and why we need to pay more attention to her? Absolutely. So Mary is the first surviving into adulthood child of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. And so she also has a little sister, Elizabeth I, and has a younger brother, Edward VI. And so when Edward VI becomes king, he decides, you know, after Henry VIII, that he is going to decide who he wants to have succeed him. And so he writes, kind of in his final year and a bit, he writes what we call his device for the succession. So this is a document in 1553, which basically starts out that he will not leave the throne to Mary, he won't leave the throne to Elizabeth, that he's going to leave it to his cousin, Jane Grey, who has just become Jane Dudley because she has married Guilford Dudley, brother of Robert Dudley, who a lot of people will know from association with Elizabeth I. So he leaves the throne initially, not to Jane herself, but to any unborn sons that Jane will have. Because Edward, at this point, you know, doesn't know he's going to die soon. And so he hopes that his cousin is going to become pregnant and have a son. Because Edward really believes that the throne is strongest in the hands of men, which is not an unusual perspective at this point in time. Right. Um, but it's something that kind of gets under 2023 nerves. <laughs> and so we see as Edward comes to his final days, what's really interesting is we can see that he's crossed out Jane and her, uh, Jane's heir males, heirs male, sorry. He's crossed that out and he's gone to Jane and her heirs male. And so he effectively now is going, I know I'm dying. Jane doesn't have any sons yet, but I still want to leave the throne to her because she's Protestant. And of course, Elizabeth I, still Princess Elizabeth, Lady Elizabeth at this point, is Protestant. But it gets messy if you take one sister out, the other sister is going to be upset. The whole family dynamics. So the throne, the throne goes to Jane Dudley. And Mary learns about Edward's death and learns that she has not been proclaimed queen. And she's understandably upset about this. She's been preparing her whole life to be a queen consort if she marries. Or when they realize that there's just one other <laughs> Tudor brother, that she's going to be queen of England. And she kind of goes, this isn't right. I should be queen. And so she is at Framlingham at this point and raises her troops. At the same time, John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, the new Queen Jane's father-in-law, is also raising troops to kind of say, Jane is queen, accept it, we're going to fight Mary. And the people of England don't go, we like Jane, keep her on the throne, she's Protestant. Right. They go, we might not like Mary's religion. Mary is still Henry VIII's daughter. She still deserves to be on the throne. And so the people of England really step up and go, we're not supporting Jane. We want Mary as queen. And so there are kind of these nine to 13 days, depending how you count it, <laughs> um, where Jane is queen until Mary and her troops eventually kind of arrive and say, I am the queen. This is my England. Thank you. You've done your service. <laughs> We're done here. 
Uh, and so it, it is a fight for the throne and the people really back Mary up on this, that she should be the one who inherits. So it's a, a strange summer in 1553 of a king and then two queens. Right. But it is quite quite a big moment for Mary and the the love of the people. Right. And I think that's really important because sometimes our perception is that she was not popular. But in fact, she was so popular that, and I think we also think, well, of course, Jane Grey Dudley didn't last. But at the time, a lot of people thought she would. She was in the tower. She had the royal troops. She had the late king's approval. I mean, there, there was a lot in Jane's camp that she would make it. And so really, Mary was incredibly brave and strong to stand up. And then the people really swelled to her in a in a wonderful way, if you're Mary, not so much if you're Jane, but if you're Mary, that's a wonderful stamp of approval. I mean, she really sort of rode that wave right to the throne. Yeah, and this this idea that we have, I know often the, the research I do was saying how the, the English narrative in history has been written by Protestants. But what happens really when Jane is queen is that the minute she is the former queen and Mary becomes queen, that narrative is really written for that brief amount of time by the Catholic winner. And so in reality, if we kind of take out the very technical legal bits, Edward has named Jane queen. And so Mary in challenging that can really be seen to be usurping the throne. Right. But we get that, those five years as, well, this is how it should have been, even though we might look at this going on in another country and mm -hmm. go, well, this isn't, no, she's just <laughs> stolen the throne from someone. <laughs> Mary has stolen the throne from Jane. And so it's it's a very intriguing bit that we try to write Mary out so much, but in that we've kind of written Jane out so right. much, mm -hmm. um, which poor Jane doesn't deserve. Right. No, no, none of this was ever uh, Jane's fault. But you do have Mary and her total belief that it's her throne taking control of the narrative and taking control of the government and the country. And and that's that's how she comes in. And so then her first maybe big choice, I mean, she decides to be crowned before she holds parliament. And that's really wonderful. And I love that moment where she decides she needs Catholic anointing oil. And again, this to me is so Mary. This is the Mary I love. And I think we sometimes lose is she's going to have Catholic oil. And if she has to sneak it in, she's going to sneak it in because she is not going to be anointed with that tainted Protestant oil. So she is constantly seizing control of various things, which I love about her. I just, I just have to say that's a moment I love. So she is crowned. She calls parliament. She reinstates her parents' marriage. So there's no question there. And then her next big question really is marriage, right? So tell, tell us a little bit about why marriage is so important and, and her thoughts on marriage. Yeah, so marriage really for any royal woman, any royal man is incredibly important in the early modern world. Um, it is so important because in order to have an heir, you need to have a marriage. You can't have an illegitimate child who's going to succeed. And so Mary knows that when she comes to the throne, this is something she has to do. She has to find a husband. She has to get married. And so she really starts and goes, you know, who, who are my options? And she looks in England, but the issue with looking in England is that any English man is going to be her subject. Right. And in the early modern world where men and husbands are seen as kind of the leader of the household and that they're the ones who are kind of deciding what happens, it's not right in massive air quotes, for the wife to be telling the husband what to do. Mm -hmm. But if Mary is the queen, 
she should be telling her subjects what to do because she's the queen. So there's this weird tension with an English husband, if she decides to marry an Englishman, that she will tell him what to do as queen, but he will tell her what to do as her husband. And so kind of everyone puts their heads together and the council talks about it and they go, this is not a great option. We're not, this isn't really great. It's not going to work well. And so they start looking abroad. And the issue with that is somewhat similar. So in a good sense, a foreign husband will not be a subject. So Mary can tell him what to do. Um, and it's not an issue. They're kind of more equals. But what comes with that is this fear that a foreign husband is going to tell Mary as a wife what she can and cannot do. And so there's this concern that a foreign husband will mean that kind of Mary is going to listen to some other country and that England is going to be sucked into some foreign empire. Mm -hmm. And so when Philip II's name comes up, this is a massive concern for people that, you know, how are we going to make it that Philip doesn't control England? How are we going to make it that Spain is not taking England into its empire? Right. And that's something that I think Mary is really conscious of because part of their marriage treaty really clearly states, you know, this is what Philip can do and this is what Philip can't do. And the list of things that Philip can't do is very long. <laughs> um, he's not allowed to take Mary out of England without her permission and without the council's permission. He's not allowed to take any children they have out of the country without permission. He's not allowed to have access and control over forts and castles. So he's not allowed to have this physical backup. Um, and there are really strict rules put in for these what if scenarios. So what if Philip and Mary have a son? What is he going to inherit? What if Philip and Mary have a daughter? What is she going to inherit? What if they have one son and multiple daughters? What if they have, you know, multiple sons and one daughter? What if they have multiples of one, but not the other? Um, there really is a setting out of if A happens, then B happens. If C happens, then D happens. So it's kind of one of those follow your own adventure where you can have multiple possibilities. But the big issue is that Mary and her council know she has to marry. It's seen mm -hmm. as kind of unnatural for a royal woman to be unmarried in this position. And this idea that women can't hold power without kind of support, without male guidance. Mm -hmm. And who better in this view of the world to give this support than a husband? And so everyone knows that Mary has to marry and Mary knows that Mary has to marry, but it becomes this difficult conversation of who she's going to marry and what that means for England. And that's something that and if even after she dies, that's a conversation that keeps going of what if it had happened differently or what if they had had children uh -huh. or... Uh -huh. Kind of what if she had been queen longer? Longer, right. Yeah, and it, it becomes just this very convoluted, very conflicting opinions on, you know, we know Mary has to marry, but no one can seem to agree how to do that, that right. England is the safest possible. So that So that's really interesting. So that is baked in to that preference for the male heir. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, we, of course, and I think rightly so in a lot of ways, we give Henry VIII a lot of grief for going through wives the way he did. However, it is important to understand this is exactly what he was concerned about. The, the difficulty associated in these days where typically if a woman in England gets married and she's had some property, that property immediately becomes her husband's. 
And so Mary had to really rewrite marital expectations like you just laid out. This is not a typical marriage agreement. She had to create something brand new to accommodate her role as queen marrying a foreign prince and then he became king of Spain. So all of that sort of had to be done in a totally new way. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of this idea as you say that there's there's no precedent for this mm-hmm. you know how elizabeth can look at mary and go here's how she dealt with it mm-hmm. mary doesn't have anyone to look at right. to figure out how to deal with this um she can look at jane to a certain extent and can go you know well that this worked and this didn't work but there's not really a how-to guide at this point right and kind of one of one of those interesting things that out of you bring up is this question of you know what what is philip's role going to be and what is he going kind of to be to be let to do right and one of those kind of big conversations then is what about titles is what about where he physically is going to live and kind of this this conversation of how do we in a sense control this Right. And how are we going to make sure that kind of this desire for male guidance and this desire for children doesn't mean that England becomes kind of a, a colony of Spain in a sense? Right. Yes. Yes. And it, it's just such a new thing because typically if Mary were a princess, she would just go live in Spain with her husband, the king, and the, and that would be easy. This is all brand new it's all new ground and and so how do you think she decided on philip versus some of the other choices did she take other choices seriously was it always philip i think it's kind of a a mix of both i don't think it was always philip um there were some other names thrown into the hat um one of the ones that often gets thrown out as an option is Reginald Pole, Reginald Poole, um, who was Mary's close family friend. His mother had been one of Mary's ladies yes. her whole life. Um, and so that gets thrown out as an option. You know, he's basically part of the family. He's a good mm-hmm. Catholic. Mm-hmm. We know that he's from a good family. So he's an option. Um, but the problem with that is he's not actually an in England at the time Mm -hmm. and so he's going to need to get there and that problem again with well he's a subject and so I think Mary really settles on Philip because Philip is the bachelor at this point in England right right. um, and, and in Europe he is the best choice that Mary can make he is heir to Charles V so he's Holy Roman Emperor um, so when Charles V decides that you know he wants to retire, he doesn't want this anymore, uh, he doesn't want to be Holy Roman Emperor, he retires, in a sense, and gives the properties and territories that he controls, gives those to his brother and to his son. And so Philip inherits a lot of his father Charles V's territories. And looking at that, in 1553 when Mary's deciding who she's going to marry that's a pretty great CV if you can go (laughs) well I'm about to be queen consort of all of these places Mm -hmm. when Philip inherits those and so really Philip is whether the whether the historical narrative agrees or not (laughs) Philip is kind of the best choice for Mary because Mm -hmm. he brings the titles he brings the prestige he brings Mm -hmm. the reputation and I think at a certain point he also is that tie to maybe that simpler part of Mary's life right um that easier part when her parents are still married yes and she has that tie to her mother's family Mm -hmm. and so Catherine of Aragon is this is where it gets complicated is Charles V's aunt Mm -hmm. so Mary and Philip are cousins once removed um 
so it it is in a sense that when Mary's growing up, she obviously greatly respects her mother. And mm-hmm. when she no longer has her mother there, she is reliant kind of in, in a good sense of the word. Right. Yes. That she has a, a great respect for what the imperial ambassador has to say yes. and has a great respect for what Charles V has to say. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that maybe influences Mary. Yes. But it certainly isn't Charles' decision. Right. It's not kind of Mary, you are going to marry him or you're going to marry no one. I think he he very much offers his son and Philip finds out after the fact. <laughs> um, but I think this is Mary's choice in this. She kind of takes in everyone's opinions. But at the end of the day, it's it's her call who she wants to marry because this is her realm Mm -hmm. that he is going to be part of and on that personal level she's she's the one who has to live with him and so it's her decision that I think is influenced as any big decision in someone's life is going to be is influenced by the people around her right and I think she does have really fond um, warm feelings for Charles V and the way he has supported her during Edward's reign and so this probably felt, you know, and and reminder of her mother, you know, it's hard because she loved her mother so much. All right. So she makes the decision and then we have the Wyatt rebellion sort of in response to that decision. So walk us through that just real quickly, because that is part of it. It is a massive part of it. So what happens is kind of word leaks out that Mary is thinking of marrying Philip. And there have been kind of discussions back and forth, but nothing official. They haven't gone, here's the wedding date. (laughs) And Thomas Wyatt decides that he is not a fan of this. He does not want to have a Spanish king. He does not want to have Philip II as his queen's husband. He just doesn't really want that influence in England. And so he raises an army and their whole plan is in the simplest of terms that they're going to raise an army, they're going to march on London, they're going to take London and they're going to take the queen hostage. Uh, no fall, no flaws in this plan whatsoever. Oh no. <laughs> um, he thinks this is a great idea. But what he doesn't count on is that when he raises his troops and heads to London the city of London looks at this rebellion and goes no thank you we don't really want that (laughs) and they basically shut the city gates on him um they physically block bridges they physically make it that he cannot enter the city and any support that Wyatt had kind of marching to London, the closer they get to the city, the more people are kind of slinking off at the side and going, you know, this this isn't a great idea. We're going to get in a lot of trouble if it doesn't work. Let's just leave now while we can. So he gets to London with limited support, um, certainly less support than he had started with. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't factor in how the city of London is going to respond. And so we have this famous speech from Mary at the London Guildhall. And she, in this speech, essentially has kind of that pre-Tilbury moment. Mm-hmm. We think of Elizabeth right. I and that's, you know, Elizabeth's moment. Mm-hmm. This is Mary's equivalent. And she essentially rallies her troops. And she says, you know, I'm not married. I don't know what it's like to have a child. But the love I have for you is what I think a mother would have for her child. And so she basically goes, I'm not a biological mother, but I'm a metaphorical mother to you. And that's the same way that I love you and care for you and want you to be okay. And the troops really respond really well to this. Right. And so... This support for Wyatt basically disappears. And 
this is crisis averted, uh, the rebellion is stopped, and there are a few of the leaders who are punished, but it's not the same as when we see rebellions under Henry VIII, right. kind of everyone involved is executed. Yeah. The yeah. decision is made that they're going to take kind of the one or two big leaders, they're going to make examples of a handful of people instead of everyone. And so this original protest to the marriage washes away really right. quickly. And it's not until we get to Elizabeth I's marriage negotiations, until we get to discussions of way later, Charles I marrying a Catholic princess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's only then that we really see this growth of this idea that Wyatt's Rebellion was this well-intentioned, fantastic mm -hmm. thing to save England. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. at the time, in 1554, there's not a massive push against Philip. There right. is concern, and Mary and her council are trying to mitigate that. Mm -hmm. But there isn't kind of the mass anger at the marriage that it often is portrayed as, which right. is really interesting looking at that historically. No, it, I think that's really true. What at the time, what you really see is here's Mary again, knowing exactly what to do and being brave and decisive and strategic and standing up and being a great orator. We don't always think of that, but that's really in that time, what it was about. It was about her yeah. saying, I hear you and I get it. And we're taking steps. It will be okay. And then everybody saying, I mean, the majority of people saying, oh, okay. You know, and, and getting on board with her. So uh, that's so great because it's later and, and the later narrative sort of takes over that. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's really interesting mm -hmm. is that when we look at these later narratives, we talk about I guess the, the narrative talks about how much everyone hated Philip and, you know, nobody wanted him here. Yeah. And, and of course, there there were isolated incidents mm -hmm. of kind of anti-Spanish aggression. Right. But what I think is is really interesting and that a lot of people don't realize is kind of Philip himself was not the biggest fan of this plan. Uh, and I think it's Alexander Sampson who's written in his work um, a few years ago now on Mary and Philip, um, kind of the marriage of Habsburg Spain and Tudor mm -hmm. England, mm -hmm. in this idea that Philip actually signed a, basically a waiver for the marriage that says, you know, I did this under duress. <laughs> it's not my fault. I'd like to leave now. And he he basically has this this back out option mm -hmm. that if mm -hmm. Mary doesn't conceive, if Mary doesn't have children, that he can go, well, this marriage isn't valid because I was forced into it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting that, you know, Philip isn't looking at Mary and going, you know, here's my meal ticket. This is how right. I'm going to expand my empire. Yeah. Here's how I get England. He's yeah. going, <laughs> yeah, he's going, I don't really want this, but I have to. And I think that's fascinating that he is approaching this very much according to Samson's interpretation and that reading of the sources, that Philip is approaching this as a dynastic move, mm -hmm. that he has a son, but it's always good to have the heir in the spare. It's mm -hmm. always good to mm -hmm. have a backup. And so Mary is going to be the provider of that backup. Mm -hmm. And so Philip doesn't get to England basically thinking I'm going to take it over. Right. He's going with kind of a, a very Henry VIII, the very early modern view of <laughs> I just need another son. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That is that is interesting. So so Philip comes and they are married at Winchester, interestingly, not in London. So then what is, can you give us some, maybe some highlights or some points in the marriage, some important points in this marriage? Because it does happen, he does come, they are married. 
Um, Mary has, as you mentioned, all of these um, specifications about what he cannot do, which sort of overshadow those few things he can do. <laughs> um, so tell us about the marriage. So I guess we'll start with kind of the wedding itself. Yes. As you say, it happens in Winchester Cathedral. So it happens outside of London, partly because I think they're concerned about how London is going to react. And I think partly just for ease that Philip is coming by boat. The channel <laughs> does not yet exist. He's coming by boat um, and is going to be landing out Southampton. And mm -hmm. so it's easier for him to get mm -hmm. Southampton to Winchester than it is Southampton to London. Right. And Winchester is historically an incredibly significant city in England. Right. And so it's not, it's not as if they've picked kind of a, a backwater rural town. Right. Um, they have picked kind of a major city, though it is interesting that it isn't London. Mm -hmm. So they pick Winchester Cathedral, or I guess Mary picks it. Philip just shows up and they decide that Mary is going to be during the, the wedding ceremony, that Mary is going to be in the most prestigious position. And so that is very much a statement to mm -hmm. Philip, to his Spanish um, kind of group that's come with him to England that Mary is in charge. Mm -hmm. She might be getting married, but she is still the queen in her own right, which I love. Mm -hmm. And then we have this moment, and I just think in the best sense of the world, it is simultaneously petty and empowering <laughs> that everyone comments that when they have their wedding feast at Wolvesey Palace, which is the the Bishop of Winchester's home, mm -hmm. quite quite a large home, um, kind of behind the cathedral, that Mary is served on gold plate and Philip is only served on silver. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. think, like you remind him with every mm -hmm. bite that you're in charge. And all um, the people can see that. I love the part too, that this is such a visual cue to everyone. Yeah. There's you don't need to know kind of the ins and outs mm -hmm. of, of politics to know that gold is better than silver. Right. You don't have to have read Mary the marriage on, agreement. You can see it. Yeah. 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 And this this gets spread. This is part of kind of some of these observations that trickle down to people. Mm -hmm. And people who weren't at the wedding feast will have heard this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that really sets the tone for the start of their marriage. And that the next kind of big thing that happens in their marriage is this first, first or only, it's very hard to diagnose backwards, um, this first pregnancy or phantom pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So shortly after they get married, um, by the end of 1554, beginning of 1555, there is the official announcement that Mary is pregnant. And at this point, there are no ultrasounds. There's no <laughs> easy way that we have today to tell pregnancy. And she feels the child moving. And so that's often the first kind of mm -hmm. confirmation for a woman in the early modern world that she is in fact pregnant mm -hmm. and so we have this this movement the quickening of the child and it's officially announced there's going to be a new heir it's all very exciting mary goes into confinement at hampton court so she starts her kind of final month and a bit leading up to mm -hmm. the due date the due date comes and goes and there's no baby mm -hmm. and so there are rumors that somehow get out of the palace that she has given birth and it's a boy and everyone's so excited. And then the palace has to go, okay, we don't know who told you that, but that's not right. Yeah. And so there are massive bonfires. They're celebrating. Everyone's ecstatic. And then some poor soul has to be the one who goes, you should put out the bonfire because <laughs> yeah. there's no baby yet. And so it turns out that there is not going to be a baby. Mm -hmm. um again it's very hard to look at history and go well this is what 
the issue was. Right. So it could have been that she was pregnant and miscarried. It could have been that she wasn't pregnant but thought she was. So is this a phantom pregnancy? Um, and at the time, I think people are, are confused. But there's the sense that, you know, well, if she can get pregnant once, she can get pregnant again. Right. And so there's not too much concern about it. But then we have, once Mary dies and isn't able to defend herself, we get a lot of interpretations of this first pregnancy especially, but also the second that happens right. in 1558, mm -hmm. um, kind of right before she dies. There start to be these interpretations that she was never pregnant and she knew mm -hmm. she wasn't pregnant, uh -huh. but this was all just kind of a ploy so that she could sneak someone else's son in, claim it as her own, and kind of set up this dynastic stability, which is a very warming pan scandal of her. Right. <laughs> uh, this very much is, is a preface, in a sense, to what happens in 1688 mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. this rumor that there's been a someone else's child brought in mm -hmm. and the queen mm -hmm. hasn't actually given birth. right yeah and so these pregnancies are really used posthumously against mary yes as a sort of way to say well she's a liar she couldn't provide for england she would rather have england catholic and illegitimate than mm -hmm. have no child and for it to be protestant mm -hmm. and so that's again one of these really tough moments for i think any early modern royal woman right is part of being a queen especially a queen consort is to provide heirs and mary isn't doing that and and she remembers and her mother's history yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's going to be this, on her this, mind all the time. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is a day and age where, you know, having one or two live to adulthood is incredible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen, I mean, even by the time we get to Queen Anne, 17 pregnancies. Right. right. And a child who lives for a few years. Right. Yeah. That, kind of pregnancy and carrying a child to term if you can conceive is is it's not that it's rare but that is in a sense a miracle in and of itself right yes um, and for that child to then live into yes. adulthood is again right miraculous odds are against you all the time always and so i think in any other situation mary may have been judged differently in the sense of you know well if she can get pregnant once we can try again and i think because she comes from catherine of aragon and mm -hmm. kind of those infamous struggles mm -hmm. with fertility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's that struggle to have a child that survives into adulthood um from both her and henry but it's well, that's often the thing. Placed on, it's on Catherine. Always placed on Catherine, despite the fact that in six wives you get one son with the same Henry. It's always the woman's fault. All six women, except for Jane Seymour, right? But but at the time it would have been she's inherited Catherine's problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it certainly is a woman who gets fault. Blamed. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and so kind of that adds this layer onto it. And then the fact that she doesn't have a child and so kind of can't continue that that dynasty right. is really held against her by Protestant writers later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's really held against her as kind of being a, a failure of a woman and a failure of a queen mm -hmm. that in this early modern mindset, her job as a wife is to have a child. Right. And she yes. doesn't. And so that's used. And obviously in 2023, we know that kind of the ability or the desire to have children does not define a woman. Right. But yeah. in the early modern yes. world, it unfortunately does if you're royal. Yes. And mm -hmm. that is used against Mary very much 
as as a way to kind of say, well, she couldn't do this one job. Right. She had one and, job and she failed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though she does all sorts of other things, she kind of reforms the currency. She mm -hmm. stabilizes England mm -hmm. kind of politically. She brings England kind of metaphorically closer to the continent. Mm -hmm. There are great right. moments in Mary's reign and they're overshadowed rightly and wrongly they're overshadowed by her not having a child yeah. and they're overshadowed by the religious policy and of course not saying we need to kind of leave out the the bad things that have happened in religious policy but is that that balance of there's good and there's bad right, right. and then there are expectations that kind of marry Mary is set up for failure mm -hmm. based on those expectations. Right. And later historians who misrepresent what happened really embellish on what even at the time she felt bad that she hadn't had children. So it's not like she didn't care. She did feel very bad about that. And, and so, you know, but it didn't define her whole reign. It didn't define her. And then the idea that people are saying, oh, she would have snuck in another child that wasn't even royal. She'd go to any lengths, you know, which certainly she was very much a believer in the royal line. She based her claim to the throne on that. I mean, she cared a lot about that. So, yeah. so that's, that's so interesting. So as we come to the end of Mary's life and she believes she's pregnant again and writes a will talking about that and talking about her husband and all of that. It seems to me, and again, I'm reading some of this later representation of it, but it seems to me that fewer people take the second pregnancy as seriously as she does. Is that true at the time or is that another sort of later embellishment? Yeah, I think some of it is true at the time some of it is embellishment okay. <laughs> um so there is the second birth is not announced as formally um we don't have in the second pregnancy or or suspected pregnancy we don't have the writing of birth announcements so we have and it is one day, maybe now that I have time, I'll go to the <laughs> National Archives to see them. But they have existing copies from the first pregnancy of the announcement where it's basically, here's all the info, you know, fill out name, date, <laughs> wait kind of thing. Um, so very much like a modern birth where there's everything and you just have to fill out the specifics. Mm -hmm. They have that for Mary and they have them ready to be sent out when this this baby is born and that's not something that happens for the second one okay and i think people are within her circle and outside of her circle i think are less willing to believe that it's a pregnancy okay the first one kind of everyone is saying to mary listen you have all the symptoms you are pregnant like what do you think this is and she's going are you sure? Like you, you must be wrong. It, no, it can't be a baby. And the second one, she's so sure it's a baby. And then those around her are going, okay, but is it? <laughs> and so there's kind of that flipped of she mm -hmm. needs convincing the first time and the second time others need convincing. Okay. Okay. And at this point by 1558 or 57 into 58, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Philip has been increasingly absent from England right and I think just kind of statistically looking at it it's not as if and I'll try to put this delicately it's not as if they can be trying all the time right that he's absent a lot you know mm -hmm. this, this would have to be perfect timing mm -hmm. which it could have been um, but I think people are kind of increasingly you know how how is this working exactly? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so she writes her will at the beginning of 1558. And basically it begins by saying that she's writing her will because 
she is pregnant Mm -hmm. and she Mm -hmm. knows how dangerous pregnancy and especially childbirth is at this point and so she knows that she needs to have her realm in order that if she dies in childbirth or shortly after she needs to have it ready to say you know is philip going to be the regent who is going to care for the child you know what what happens and so that's all written out and then we have a codicil uh basically an an appendix and an Mm -hmm. amendment added to the will in october of 1558 um, she ultimately dies on November the 17th uh-huh. so October uh-huh. kind of is in hindsight is that last uh-huh. full month that she has and this at the very end of the month she makes this amendment and basically admits I'm not pregnant which means that if I'm not pregnant and have these symptoms something must be wrong uh-huh. and so she essentially is looking death in the face and is knowing that it's coming but she doesn't know when Mm -hmm. and so she admits that she isn't pregnant she admits that she does not have a child she she does not have her child who is going to succeed her and she kind of admits this is where life is at right now and kind of historically it's an incredible document to hold to know that she's looking at this knowing she's ill Mm -hmm. but maybe not knowing how ill right but knowing that she needs to be facing this reality Mm -hmm. and then there's that personal moment where you go like she just wanted a baby Mm -hmm. she she just wants to leave England in good hands Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. there's that kind of personal when you take that step back and go you know her her world is crumbling around her right and she's needing to figure that out by herself right Um, she has her ladies with her but kind of the same that I think we often saw with the other consort Philip (laughs) with Elizabeth II is that being the monarch is a very lonely position right because none of Mary's ladies will understand completely the pressures Mm -hmm. and there's no one at the court who will understand exactly what it means to be monarch right and I think it's those moments of humanity yes that really get you and and that's another one that I when I have time would love to see is Mary had a prayer book and on the page for safe conception and delivery Mm -hmm. of a child, it's tear stained. Oh yeah. And so just that, that human moment Mm -hmm. of especially knowing how committed to her faith she was. Right. That she spent time on these pages and obviously had it open with really strong feelings Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is just so humanizing in a way yes Yes. even when we look at the persecution and go you know I don't understand how someone can do that it's not that she's completely evil there are still these moments of humanity right that she is trying her very best She's doing what she and thinks sometimes she it's not working to save the people exactly. she's trying to say. And one of the things I love exactly. about that will is when she first starts it, even though she knows that pregnancy and childbirth are really dangerous, she, believing myself to be with child. I mean, she's so excited in a way, you know, there's, I, I know it's really dangerous, but I think I'm with child. And then at the exactly. end, when she realizes I'm not, you know, there's this whole wave of emotion just in that document plus codicil. Um, that I think gives us a glimpse into the personal behind the political, right? She knows it's important politically, but she so wants a baby. Yes. And for the country and for the, herself. Exactly. She just wants, she, she wants a family. She wants stability for her biological family mm-hmm. and for her metaphorical mm-hmm. people of England family. Yeah, And yeah. I mean, that's, that's all that any monarch I think wants mm-hmm. is stability of the dynasty. 
Right. And, you know, we don't hold that against Elizabeth the first. Right. And yet at the end of their lives, they're in that same position. They're in the same that position. That yeah. neither of them have children. They both are kind of leaving England with the unofficial recognition of who the heir will be, mm-hmm. but without saying, you know, leave the throne to mm-hmm. this person. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just fascinating that in all the ways that these women are different right. and all the ways yes. that their queenship is different, they end their lives kind of in the same way yes that they're in the same position that there is not a, a biological right. heir mm-hmm. it is kind of going back up the family and then down another branch right to find yes. the next monarch to find the next monarch and it kind of makes me think too so as you're saying there are these similarities it kind of reminds me of I have to just say the new exhibition at Hever, right? About Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn and some of the similarities there, right? Because they had a lot of similarities too. And then their daughters end up with more similarities than you might have thought um, if you looked at how different Catherine and Anne were, but then Catherine and Anne had a lot of similarities. So it's this whole, I think part of it's just this woman's experience of the early modern period. And the closer you get to that seat of power, the more dangerous it is and the more expectations are on you. Um, So I think we need to have, and I'm so grateful for all your work because it reminds us we need to have some grace for Mary. And, you know, many of the later historians do not, uh, the immediately later historians, but thank goodness now we do have more um, open and more humanity-based ways of looking at her. So um, I, I do just want to end with, so, so after Mary passes away and Philip is no, and, it, and that's really clear in her, he does not inherit oh, yeah. from her England, oh. right? <laughs> so no, she is very clear. <laughs> She's very clear about that. Um, but uh, Philip's story with England is not over and it's not over for a long time in a lot of ways, but the most immediate next step in Philip's story is his proposal or his offer to Elizabeth when Elizabeth becomes queen. So I do just want to know if you have thoughts about, does he want to come back and be king of England again? Does, do you think that's a legitimate offer? Is it just sort of for show to establish we want to stay friends because politically he certainly at that point is not supporting Mary Queen of Scots because she's about to become queen of France. And that's the last thing he wants. So he does want to remain friendly with England politically. Do you think that's a real proposal or is that impossible to know? I think I can give an educated guess, okay, but it, it is so hard to say with certainty because Philip is not helpful <laughs> and does not <laughs> right. write it down. You know, I genuinely wanted this and I'm going to go cry and mope about it for four days because she said no. Um, but I think part of it is, as as you point out, Mary Queen of Scots, Scotland is about to marry into the into the French royal family. Mm-hmm. And so we're about to have that physical alliance yeah. between Scotland to the north of England and mm-hmm. France to the south. Mm-hmm. And England is about to be surrounded. And I think Philip could have been making this as a genuine offer because it would, in a sense, put some weight behind Spain stopping France yeah. it would help Spain kind of surround France if they have England to the north of mm-hmm. France and mm-hmm. Spain to the south um yeah, I think it would put pressure on on France but the extent I think to which he genuinely is looking at Elizabeth is probably no more than political okay um I can kind of in human terms, I can understand him looking at kind of a young, beautiful, intelligent queen and going, you know, she she ticks the boxes, mm-hmm. be a good wife. But I don't think he genuinely could have lived with her. I think their religious differences were too big. Um, I think their lived experience especially for Elizabeth um, 
and kind of knowing that marriage is incredibly important in the sense that not that she has to do it, but that the implications of marriage right. are, are so, so significant. And so I don't think there's a, a genuine proposal from Philip. I mean, okay. I know he proposes. Right, I don't right, right. think it's it's a, a hoping that she'll say yes. Okay. I think it's more of a, a diplomatic thing. Yeah. Um, I'll and, make this gesture. Probably, yeah. And this, this religious attempt to to keep England officially Catholic. Mm-hmm. Um, because he he does, I think relatively quickly, he does remarry. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not to Elizabeth. We don't see kind of the the pining that right. Henry VIII had for Anne Boleyn. We mm-hmm. don't see that, you know, please, I'll give you anything you want. Just marry me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it it would have been a, a political move on his part. Um if anything and maybe that could have turned into love who knows um but i, I that's think probably it unlikely <laughs> person yeah yeah okay okay well thank you and i know we can't know for sure but i think certainly his actions and of course then they become total enemies by the end but there is they are friendly and they do keep it friendly for a while as long as Mary Queen of Scots is queen of france and then it kind of falls apart when, <laughs> when that ends i think so. it's very messy very quickly yes (laughs) yes it's interesting um all of it is interesting so thank you so much for taking us through this i think this is such an underappreciated marriage and moment in time and mary is very underappreciated and all of her strengths the good things that she does all of those overshadowed by the way she's portrayed in the aftermath which is of course what you've told us so much about so thank you thank you Dr. Joanna Strong. And you've told us you're looking at possibly turning your thesis into a book, which is exciting. So where can we follow you? And I'll, of course, put all these links in the show notes, but where can we follow you to make sure we are up on your latest research and where you are and what you're doing? Of course. So I am very active on social media. I have Twitter and Instagram. Um, I would say those out, but one of them is complicated. So I'll let you just put that in yes, the show I'll notes. put them in. I'll put them in um, and link right to them. Perfect. And then the best place to find absolutely everything is with the new title came a new website. Oh, fantastic. Um, so the website is Dr. Johanna Strong. So D-R and then J-O-H-A-N-N-A strong, no spaces, dot C-A. So okay. Dr. Johanna Strong dot C-A has all of the info. Um, it has upcoming talks, upcoming podcasts, anything that is in the horizon. Um, and then it has kind of the archive of everything I've done. And that oh, is cool. where you will find kind of as soon as any new talks, new podcasts, hopefully a book in the coming yes, days. Yes, yes, yes. We're um, waiting for it. All of that will be there. Okay. Okay. Well, I will have links to all of that, including um, the Twitter and Instagram, but definitely the website where we can find everything. And if it's easier, just go on the website and click to Twitter and Instagram from that. So you can do a one-stop shop. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being willing to be on camera. It's always fun. I, I love being able to see people and I know others do too. So thank you very much for reminding us in this February where we're looking at romance, that this was a marriage that really mattered. And even though it might not have ended up the way Mary would have envisioned with children and, you know, her dynasty continuing and England remaining Catholic and all those things she wanted, even though that didn't happen, it really was a marriage that mattered. And she is certainly um, a queen who changed the foundation of the monarchy, really made things different and deserves to be recognized. So Thank you for coming on, reminding us of all of that. Thank you everyone for listening and watching and we will see you again soon. Thank you.